had someone step into my office this morning and and we were talking about other faiths and other religions and others expressions of uh, who Jesus really truly is. I'm going to be touching uh, briefly on that this morning. Uh, but we recognize him here in this place of worship to be the Son of God, the only one that uh, can lead you to the Father on the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus said. And that's very, very true. Very, very true. Well, Otho, as I was uh, entering uh, the area of Lathrop this morning, I saw a bunch of snow geese out here north of town. I don't know if that's uh, what the ladies were stepping on or not. (laughs) But I also saw some uh, snow geese uh, out of my patio door this morning. To me, that's a beautiful sight. It reminds me of God's beautiful creation and how he spoke the world into existence and everything that we know. Uh, That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. He also created elephants. How does an elephant hide in a strawberry patch? He paints his toenails red. (laughs) So this last executive team, uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk with was about elephants in the room. Elephants in the room. Because, you know, they really can't hide, even though if they paint their toenails red. But I've discovered at the top of my list of elephants in the room is evangelism. And that's what I want to talk about today. Evangelism. Personally, about every church that Geneva and I have ever been involved in, and I took time to count it up this morning, 13 different congregations. You're the 13th. 13 different congregations. You know, as Southern Baptists, we used to be known about our evangelism. We were very, very evangelistic. Uh, We used to have evangelism conferences once a year, somewhere across the state, and I would always go to those because they were always encouraging and inspirational and gave me a little bit of a shot in the arm, if you will. But today... Even as Southern Baptists, we're on the decline of evangelism. We're on the decline. People are not coming into the fellowship of the church because we're not going out to those that are outside the walls of the church and reaching them for Jesus Christ. You remember uh, a few months ago, we had a brainstorm gathering on a Sunday afternoon. And what really surfaced out of that brainstorm time, you as a congregation, as you're expressing some concerns and some points of prayer, the top of the list was evangelism. That was a little bit surprising to me, but it shouldn't be. Because evangelism is some of the things that we need to be emphasizing in everything that we do. Matter of fact, if there's anything going on at First Baptist Church of Lathrop in ministry and ministries, and it does not have one of the major things that you're emphasizing, evangelism, we need to stop. We need to stop. There was a time in Southern Baptist history that you actually came to Sunday school at 9.30 in the morning, not just because you were a member of that class, but because you had someone that you were trying to reach for Christ and you invited them as a visitor to come with you so that they might be under the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. Evangelism. Evangelism. But we're missing that today in most of our churches that I've ever been involved in. And I don't think Lathrop is any different than that. Now, I personally do not have what I would call the gift of evangelism, where I'd be an evangelist instead of a pastor, instead of a pastor. But I do have the role of evangelism, not just because I'm a minister, but because I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so every one of you, every one of you as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have the responsibility and the role of evangelism. Evangelism. Somebody was talking this last week. I can't remember who it was now. It's immaterial at that point. But they were highlighting the difficulty that they had on the workplace and the people that they were coming in contact with. That's a mission field, folks. That's a mission field. Wherever we're involved and the purpose that God has placed you in that unusual circumstance possibly is so that you might 
become aware of those that do not know Christ as Savior, and you are the evangelist on the scene. And you need to be taking the good news of Jesus Christ to those that you're working with, those that you socialize with. So let's look at the familiar passage of Matthew, Matthew the 28th chapter, and I want to begin there in verse 16. Verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We're in the midst of all of that right now. We're in the midst of that as we wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back and to receive us unto himself as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's the point. Ever since Jesus' birth, this has been God's command upon his kingdom's work. What Jesus spoke here as the disciples gathered with him there in that special place. So let me just highlight that real quickly. Actually, I began to make notes of this way back after Christmas time. And I just pulled it out of my file off my table the other day, and I thought this is the time for me to share this particular message with this congregation. So think back with me as Jesus was born there in Bethlehem. The first episode that we have is when the shepherds came out of the Galilean hillside and they gathered there in that particular part where Jesus was being born. Mary and Joseph were there. He'd just been born. You remember the account of Christmas time where the angelic host came and revealed it to the shepherds and they left their sheep there on the flocks and came into Bethlehem and worshiped him and fell down in that particular aspect. So let's look at that real quickly back in Luke, the second chapter, back in Luke, the second chapter, as the shepherds have come there and worshiped the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to pick it up in verse 17. In verse 17. It says, And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Just as they had been told. Now I want to highlight that just for a few moments as we think about that together. Here we have the Galilean shepherds that have come in to the place where the Lord Jesus Christ was born on that occasion. And they saw him there with Mary and Joseph, the babe lying there in the manger. They saw it with their own eyes. They took it in. But you know, I hadn't really thought about this. I wonder in that intermediate time of worship and being there in Jesus' presence and recognizing uh, all of the things about Jesus at that point, and I, I preached about that during Christmas time, so I'm not going to go into all of those great details about the shepherds. But here's something that I really hadn't thought seriously about. Don't you think that probably during that time, Mary, as well as Joseph, to the, told them the story about what they'd already experienced before his birth? Before his birth. You know, the encounter that Mary had with Gabriel when she conceived of God through the Holy Spirit. And then Joseph, as he was com contemplating whether he would go ahead and follow through with the marriage or not, because Mary now was with child and it wasn't his responsibility or his doing. And so the angel came to him in a dream and said, don't worry about it, Joseph. I've got it under control. Everything's okay. You know, I think that those shepherds probably heard Mary's perspective as well as Joseph's perspective on that occasion. But here's what I want to emphasize this morning. After that experience, the scripture says, and they returned. They went back to their sheep. After their 
stint was over for the night, they probably went back to their families. They probably started talking, talking about what they had experienced and what they had seen and what they had heard with all of their friends as well as their co-workers. You understand what I'm saying today? What they saw and what they heard, they didn't keep it to themselves. This is evangelism. We don't keep that stuff to ourselves. The experience that we've had this time of great worship this morning in song as we've been singing and worshiping together. And so on that occasion, they bowed down, they were glorified, they praised God, but they went outside their walls of comfort and they went back into their homes and they began to share. They began to share just as they had seen and heard all of what was taking place there in Bethlehem on that particular occasion. It started then, folks. Evangelism started then, as we understand it to be. And then it went on for another two years. The wise men came, we think, about two years later. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby. Now they were in a house, as Scripture says, in Matthew's account of the wise men coming. If you want to look at that, back there in Matthew, the second chapter, uh, as we think about that together. And so there they were, the wise men, a similar experience that what the shepherds had had two years earlier, and now the wise men are going through that whole process. And guess what? I'll bet that Mary and Joseph shared the same stories again of all of what had taken place prior to Jesus' birth as well too. And so their experience was just as they had heard and seen, just like the shepherds there in Bethlehem on that occasion. But the scripture says they returned. They went back to the east and they took all of that with them, the knowledge and what they had seen. And they began to share, I believe, with those back in their homelands, sharing in evangelism, sharing in evangelism, telling the good story that they heard and seen and who Jesus truly was. So here it is for us. We've heard, we've seen by faith, but what are we doing with it? That's evangelism. And honestly, folks, even as Southern Baptists, we're failing in this particular aspect. We're failing in this aspect. We're not sharing on our workplace site. We're not sharing with our neighbors. We're not sharing with our family. We're not sharing with our friends like we should be, even as God instituted it there your family, your friends, your neighbors. A couple of weeks ago, Geneva and I were going to go down and visit with the kids around the Sedalia area, and so uh, we just were going through Higginsville on 13. And I'd seen this little greasy spoon restaurant, I would call it. That's what I thought it was. And so we decided, well, it's lunchtime, let's stop here. So they were open. We went in. I was really amazed. I was really amazed. This little place is called the Red Shanty. Have you ever been there? You ought to go sometime. You ought to go sometime. They've got great, great food. But here's the neat part about it. Not every time now, I must admit, not every time as I introduce myself to somebody or a waitress do I share and find out where they stand, but I did with this young lady. She was very, very gracious. As a matter of fact, Geneva said, boy, you better tip her well. <laughs> well, I don't know if I did well or not, but I did tip her. I did tip her. But she was a lovely young lady. And so the Lord said, he just landed on my shoulder and said, hey, Rodney, bring up Jesus. And so I said, young lady, do you know Jesus Christ is the Savior and the Lord of your life? And she said, well, yes. As a matter of fact, I'm a Lutheran and I worship in Concordia just down the road. I didn't go into great detail. I didn't question her because she wasn't a Baptist. You know, I didn't do that. But I just praised the Lord and took her on her word that she was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ because that's what I was interested in. Do you know Jesus as a Savior and the Lord of your life? Do you do that? Those people that you come in contact with? Evangelism. 
You see, folks, here's the reality. We've all been commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ, right there in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. We've all been commanded, but here's my second point. We've also been empowered. We have been empowered to do that. You don't have to do that on your own. All you need to do is open yourself up to the Holy Spirit. And when he says, Rodney, open up your mouth and ask this young lady if she knows Jesus as her Savior, and then take the conversation from there. You don't have to be skilled. It's a responsibility that we have as believers to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So turn with me to Acts, the second chapter. This is where God's empowering in great force began. In Acts, the second chapter, when the Holy Spirit came upon Peter and the disciples that were gathered there in the upper room. Remember that? I'm not going to go into great detail here. But I just want to highlight this for us this morning. You with me? After Jesus had gone to be with the Father, they were there in Jerusalem. They were gathered together. They were scared for their life because they thought they might be crucified as well as arrested and killed in whatever fashion. And so they gathered together. And that's when the Holy Spirit came upon them as believers and anointed them as tongues of fire, the Scripture says. And then... Peter and the apostles began to speak in foreign languages. Literally, that's what they were doing. Because at this particular time of Pentecost, there were people from all over the nations that had come together in Jerusalem to worship and celebrate there in the temple. And so as they heard them speaking in their own tongue, they gathered together and wanted to know what was going on. The disciples and Peter were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they witnessed then to the multitudes. And then Peter stands up and begins to explain to this great crowd that had gathered there the gospel, evangelism. Here's who you just crucified. He was God's son. He was the Messiah. He was the Christ. Now, the Scripture says they didn't fully understand all of that at this particular point in time, but they understood enough, and Peter certainly did, as he began to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those that had gathered. But here's what I want to capitalize upon this morning. Verse 37 of Acts, the second chapter. Verse 37. It says, When the people heard that great crowd that had gathered there now, It says, when the people heard this, that is Peter's witness, you can read it for yourself there, they were cut to the heart. (laughs) Cut to the heart. They were convicted. They were convicted that they had been a part of this. Maybe not physically, but spiritually they had all been consenting to and a part of that from God's understanding. And they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, What shall we do? What shall we do? You know, when I'm witnessing to somebody or somebody's asking me about Jesus and I realize that they're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I hope and pray that this is where they are right here. They're cut to the heart. God's got a hold of their heart. The Holy Spirit's been working on them. And they're ready because these folks were ready. And what does Peter say? Repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Now you have to understand that Peter was combining those two things because of his Jewish heritage. But New Testament separates those things. You repent of the Lord of your sins and you're saved at that point. That's the thief on the cross. You don't have to be baptized. As we demonstrated a couple of weeks ago, it's a testimony when a person is baptized. They're already believers. Deidre was already a believer. Paul was already a believer. And so it was a demonstration of the faith and the relationship. But Peter in this context says repent and then identify with this message of repentance. That's what baptism is. That's what baptism is. And so the scripture says, Peter says in this text right here, when you repent of your sins, you receive forgiveness. 
you are born again as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Forgiveness of your sins. And 3,000 souls were saved that day. 3,000 souls were saved that day. Have you experienced Pentecost? Well, yes, you did if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. The moment Jesus came into your heart and you confessed your sins and asked Jesus to come into your heart, that's when the Holy Spirit came in too. Now, my dear friend in Christ, you are empowered. <laughs> you just need to recognize that. You just need to recognize that you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit and the, one of the major purposes that you have been empowered is because now you are God's witness. You are witnessing for Jesus Christ himself to reach the lost, to reach the lost. Maybe you're here today or maybe you're watching online and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. But my prayer before this time of preaching was, Lord, when I say these words, I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict those that are unbelievers. I've already shared the gospel. I, literally, I've already witnessed to you if you're an unbeliever right now. Remember, earlier I said, who is Jesus? He's God's Son. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. He died for you, my dear friend, on the cross. As we sang about earlier, He took my sins and your sins upon himself and the scripture says God had to turn his way his face away from his son at that moment instantaneous moment because he was bearing the sins of the world my sins your sins the sins of the world so if you hear this instantaneous moment right here in this auditorium or you're watching online don't wait till tomorrow don't wait till tomorrow. You might not have tomorrow to come to know Jesus Christ as the Savior and the Lord of your life. You've heard the gospel. I pray that the Holy Spirit has cut your heart to the quick and you've recognized that you need Jesus. And so just right now, this instantaneous moment, we're watching online. You can ask Jesus to come into your heart right now. Right now. I think I've shared this with you before, but it was a time of revival at First Baptist Church of Maysville, and there was a lady of the community that had just walked away from the Lord, and she told me she left that night, Brother Rodney, I really wanted to come forward tonight during the invitation, but I'm going to come tomorrow night, and I'm going to come forward. And I said, you don't have to wait for the invitation. Tomorrow night, we'll deal with it. I'll just give you an opportunity right in the middle of the worship service. And that's what we did. Before the invitation. As a matter of fact, right now, I'd pause in my message. If somebody wants to stand up and walk down to the front and accept Jesus as their Savior. That's what we're here for, folks. That's what we're here for. If you'd like to come later, that's great too. Or if you're at home, drop to your knees right now. Ask Jesus into your heart. Don't wait till tomorrow. It might be too late. We've been empowered. We've been commissioned. And we have been commanded. Go back with me to Matthew that I started with. Verse 19. The NIV says, therefore go. You know literally what that says? As you are going. As you are going. Share the good news of Jesus Christ. Baptize. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. You know what these words are that we read a moment ago? Jesus' last earthly words. Wow, I wonder how important they are. <laughs> his last earthly words that he shared with his disciples. Shouldn't we take that seriously? Shouldn't we take that to heart? Shouldn't I as a believer, as well as a preacher, 
You as a believer, take those things to heart. Jesus' final words to you and to me. It's almost 46 years ago, I was at First Baptist Church of Branson. I was in my office for the morning. The phone rang and the secretary answered the phone and she buzzed me on the intercom and said, Rodney, uh, your mom and dad's pastor's on the phone and he needs to speak with you. March the 20th, 1978. Said, Rodney, I've got some bad news for you. Your dad was just killed in a truck accident this morning. I wish I could have remembered the last words that my dad had shared with me on earth. I wish I, I it's not in my memory. I don't know. I don't know what those last words were, honestly. But since I've been saved in 1956, I've heard Jesus' last words numbers of times. Numbers of times. I've heard them clearly. I've heard them numerous times. I've studied them in depth. I've even quoted them at times. King James Version. But here's the question for the morning. But am I following him on his invitation faithfully and obediently? Have I heard his commission? Have I heard his command? And am I obedient in sharing? In sharing. There are times that Geneva and I are out eating somewhere and I get up and we go to our car and I think, I should have talked to that young man. I should have said something to that young lady. How about you, my friend? You see, we've been commissioned and commanded to share. I've never saved anybody. He didn't ask us to save them. He's already done all the work that needs to be done. He just asked us to share him with them. And that's what evangelism is. That's what evangelism is. Bill Fay, who put together an evangelistic tool, I don't know if you've ever had it or not here at First Church Lathrop, but it's a good study if you've never done it before. He says about the seventh time that an unbeliever hears the gospel and the Holy Spirit's been working on them, that seventh time is magical. You see, I, when I talked to that young lady there in Higginsville, I didn't know whether she was a believer or not. If she had been an unbeliever, it could have been the first time that somebody talked to her. It could have been the fifth time. But I've had seventh time encounters. What a blessing. I mean, it warms your heart, my dear Christian friend, when you've done what Jesus asked us to do, and it's that seventh time, if you will, and they come to know Jesus Christ as the Savior and the Lord of your life. And you've been instrumental. You've just been one of God's tools out of his toolbox that he wants to use on a regular basis. That's, that's what evangelism is. How about you, my dear Christian friend? right here or watching online. How many times have you heard Jesus' last words on earth? And are we faithfully and obediently sharing because we've been commissioned, commanded, and empowered? So as you are going, it might be this afternoon, it might be a family member talking with my brother the other day and he said Rodney uh, you might not have got word yet but uh, one of our cousins just died I'd never witnessed to that cousin that I can remember I should have I haven't seen him in years and so I don't know if he's a believer with the Lord or whether he's in hell right now in punishment and torment 
How about you? Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a work associate. Maybe it's a neighbor just down the road or across the street. Maybe it's person X. You don't even know him yet. But in God's divine providence, you'll meet that person. And when we meet somebody, even if we don't know them, one of the first things that ought to come to our mind, dear friend, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Lord, you've empowered me. Now help me to open my mouth and just say simply, if you were to die today, would you see God face to face because you know Jesus as your Savior? And just take it from there because the Holy Spirit is going to help you say the words that you need to say from that point on. The gospel message of evangelism began when Jesus was born and the shepherds came and the wise men came and then as Jesus grew to 33 years of age Peter and the other apostles continued to carry on the message of evangelism and now that's been placed at our doorsteps to do the work to do the work of evangelism God help us to be faithful and to be obedient. Let's pray together. Father, the message is very, very clear today. Every one of us that are here or listening even online, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been commissioned, we have been commanded, we have been empowered to share the good news of Christ. And Lord, I pray that we might be found faithful in what we say and what we do. If there is someone here this morning that yet does not know Christ as Savior, I pray that today would be the day of salvation and that they would respond to who Jesus truly is, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the one that died on the cross and shed his blood that we might be forgiven of our sins and to come to know him as a Savior and the Lord of our life. Have your will and have your way, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen.